welcome to Jax In Conversation. Today, it's my pleasure to have Jax Conversations with Professor Scott Denmark of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he's the Reynold C. Fuson Professor of Chemistry. Um, Scott's a native New Yorker. Um, in many ways, he anticipated the trend, the global trend to globalization by carrying out uh, his doctoral studies here at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology some years ago. Um, he's received numerous accolades and is highly recognized for his excellence uh, in uh, organic chemistry, um, catalysis, uh, chemistry in general. Uh, he's received many awards and um, the most recent uh, recognition is the election to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. So welcome, Scott. Great to be here. Um, I'd like to start with a general question. Um, what is your vision for uh, chemistry and its future? How does it fit um, as this century evolves? Well, it may sound a little self-serving uh, because we've been involved in this area now for about 15 years, but I, I believe that the, the future of chemistry writ large is at the interface of the chemical sciences with artificial intelligence and machine learning. In fact, uh, just recently, the National Science Foundation has created an institute at the University of Illinois called the Molecule Maker Laboratory Institute, which brings together our outstanding chemical uh, computer science department together with the departments of chemistry and chemical and biomolecular engineering to create um, interfaces where both the development of new chemical properties and materials as well as the advances in data analysis and chemical synthesis can be accelerated by uh, applying uh, the algorithmic tools that have been developed on the computer science side. What I've discovered in recent years is that many of my graduate students coming into the department in uh, organic chemistry uh, have taken uh, classes in computer science and have learned Python coding uh, and have learned the rudimentary parts of uh, artificial intelligence as uh, as we see, it's a national trend in the United States that within STEM, uh, that c computer science is one of the most popular majors uh, across the entire enterprise in the U.S., uh, simply because of all of the tremendous advances in how AI has permeated uh, all of the scientific disciplines. So it sounds this will require revision of the curriculum in general, of what it means to get a degree in chemistry. Absolutely, and we feel that it is going to be essential for our graduates, both at the bachelor's level and the PhD level, to have a working knowledge of, uh, of int artificial intelligence and, and the power and tools of machine learning. I'm curious, do you get any pushback from colleagues that this might result in less time for chemistry for those uh, graduate students? Not really, because I have uh, buy-in uh, from our uh, industrial recruiters. And in fact, we have created uh, an industrial partners program as part of the MMLI. Uh, and I, as you know, have long relationships with many of my former students and colleagues from my years of consulting in the pharmaceutical business. And there's also a revolution taking place in the pharma industry to embrace the tools of AI. And they're looking very much toward hiring students who have expertise in both areas. And I've been able to get quotes from the uh, VPs in process and medicinal chemistry about how important it is for them to see that expertise in the people that they're hiring over the next decade. They, they see this as a major growth area. And you know, as our primary mission in academics, is to produce both new science as well as new scientists. It's uh, incumbent upon us to make sure that we're imbuing our students with the skills that will make them competitive uh, in the industries that they want to work in for the rest of their career. I got to ask, as I often get asked uh, by students this question, will AI replace synthetic planning uh, by a synthetic chemist in the future? Potentially at a certain level, certainly, you know, in scenarios where the synthesis is not necessarily the most important thing, where being able to access molecules rapidly and with high efficiency to optimize particular properties or activities 
and you can think of all of the ways in which molecular structure impacts function, you want to be able to make things quickly. I don't think that synthetic planning, for example, is going to replace chem the uh, activity of chemists who are in the process of developing new strategies, developing new reactions, where the, base, the thing about the, 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 the way in which it's applied is that these synthetic strategies will never propose a step that is unprecedented. They'll draw from the literature, from the data, uh, and no sci finder and reaxis inside out, no chemist can have that ability to remember every single transformation that's ever been published and will come up with the most efficient on the basis of the metrics that it's been, that it's been taught. But I think one of the most important things about synthetic planning that EJ taught us at the, in the very beginnings of the Lahasa program is that the goal of synthetic planning is to look for places where there is not a known transformation and to use that as a guidepost for discovery of new transformations to accelerate synthetic efficiency. Those that the programs won't do. What advice would you give to the next generation of um, researchers, of chemists? The advice I would give them is to be open-minded uh, about where the discipline is going. Uh, that's, it's difficult to do as a student because you're learning so much uh, about what has happened to build up your uh, architecture of knowledge, uh, but to keep an eye on the future uh, and recognize that you need to be adapting to the best pace at which science is changing now. Let me switch gears now. What was your experience as a young faculty? Um, what do you think was critical to your success as you were crafting your career path uh, early on? I was so fortunate, uh, despite having landed in the middle of a cornfield after enjoying Cambridge and Zurich uh, and landing in central Illinois, which I can tell you was a huge culture adjustment and shock. Nevertheless, I was so fortunate that my senior colleagues and the culture at the University of Illinois Chemistry handed down from Adams, Fuson, and Marvel uh, was the support of junior faculty. Uh, that it was a department that was built on the ability to identify young people and to nurture them and to give them every opportunity to succeed. And I, I was amazed in my very first faculty meeting when Nelson Leonard turned to me and asked my opinion about something they were discussing. I, I was just shocked that they would care about what a 27-year-old would, would have to say to these giants. Uh, but that's the culture at Illinois. So number one, it was the support of my colleagues. Number two, it was the great graduate students who had the courage to join my group, the four intrepid souls who in 1980 decided to take a chance on someone they had never seen or heard of before. Remember, we didn't do recruiting the way we do now. Uh, where they come and visit. They had no clue who I was until they met with me. And so I credit them with the courage to take on the challenge of starting a new group from nothing. And finally, also the fantastic infrastructure that exists at the University of Illinois, uh, in which all of the things that we need to be successful are provided to us. And the only limitation that we have is our own ambition and our own abilities. What do you consider your biggest accomplishment as a teacher, as a researcher, as a mentor, uh, as a consultant, or all of the above? Well, as a researcher and mentor, uh, my greatest accomplishment is having converted over 120 novices into professionals. Uh, that the students who chose to join my group and be trained by me and gone off to their own careers to to contribute to the scientific enterprise in various industries and academic environments. Uh, th those are my, that's my legacy. And that's what I'm most proud of, much greater than any, any single scientific accomplishment that sits in the journals. As a consultant, I have to say my proudest accomplishment is that I developed the process together with uh, two scientists at, Farm at Upjohn at the time that is the current manufacturing process for cortisone. Cortisone mm -hmm. is the widest selling pharmaceutical agent in the world. And in 1987, I was challenged by the vice president of process research, Verlin Van Rienen at Upjohn at the time, uh, to develop a way of taking a waste product of soybean processing and turn that into cortisone. And we did it. 
And it was a process that, not surprisingly, given my background, uses silicon chemistry. But we were able to take this waste stream, which they had collected into a football field size pit of tofu, and turn that into cortisone. And they built a, a uh, processing plant, Building 90, in uh, Portage, Michigan, that to now turns out the world supply of cortisone. And I am on that path. So uh, that's probably my proudest consulting accomplishment. Well, that's um, that's quite an accomplishment. And I would argue, by the way, it's not just humans that get cortisone. I have a dog that has some hip problems that had to get a <laughs> shot last weekend of cortisone. So he thanks you. Huh? Montezuma is his name. Montezuma thanks you um, for that. Um, so I'd like to ask you a few questions about uh, Jax. Um, yeah. What's your favorite Jax publication, if you have one, if you had to point to one? Just one. Well, you know, I can tell you an f- interesting story, if I may. Uh, about 15 years ago, we were doing some uh, remodeling in Roger Adams' laboratory and came across Roger Adams' collection of bound JACS in beautiful leather with gold embossed print. And we had to get rid of it because there was just no room and no storage. Uh, and so these beautiful Jack's bound volumes were sitting on a pallet, and a message went out to the faculty that. We're going to discard these. We can't find any takers for them because everything is online now. Before we discard them, do you want to save any for posterity? Uh, And they, of course, had Roger Adams' um, nameplate, book plate on them. So I, I did some thinking to ask, well, what publications that are so important to organic chemistry would I like to have the original bound version of? So I I made a list and I found those volumes and kept them in my office. And I looked at them recently again. And probably now I I have to span some generations, but one of my heroes in chemistry is Gilbert Newton Lewis. And probably the most important publication that I think in Jack's history is The Atom and the Molecule in 1916 by G.N. Lewis. Now, that's over 100 years ago, so that may not resonate with much of the audience. The other one that I picked up was Ferrocene, uh, the publication by Woodward, Rosenblum, and Wilkinson in 1952. That was a watershed moment, also very controversial, as you know, from the discussion with Jack Dunnitz. Sure. The others that I pulled out uh, were three publications in 1965 that collectively created the concepts of the conservation of orbital symmetry by Woodward and Hoffman on the selection rules for electrocyclization, cycloadditions, and signotropic rearrangements. So I'm sorry I I named three rather than one. I am absolutely incredibly proud of the work that Sumitra Athavala did on, on deconstructing the origins of the Selectivity in Autocatalysis and the SOI Reaction. That was just published in JACS in 2020. And it's, it's kind of a niche area, but it is a sui generis reaction that there's no other kind of a, like it in the world. And it provided a mechanistic puzzle for chemists for 25 years. How can something like this create the imbalance in molecular chirality starting from nothing. And we were able to formulate a holistic understanding at the molecular level of the catalyst structure, binding site, nonlinear effects, and transition structures together with Ken Houck and his student Adam Simon. And just for the intellectual problem-solving aspect of it, I am incredibly proud of that work. Uh, indeed, it's a monumental piece of work. Not, not only have I read the paper, but I've heard you speak um, about it. I believe at the last Eschen Moser uh, lecture, um, you gave a brilliant talk on that. And it does capture your love of mechanism, your attention to detail, and um, your, the, the, you know, you're, 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 you're always aiming to get to the bottom of how something works. And so that would be a good pick. I have to, I have to grant you that one. It's clear in talking to you that you're someone who's highly passionate about science and chemistry in particular, how do you maintain that fire, that flame, that passion over the course of a lifetime? 
Well, one of the things that uh, Peter Beek taught me, uh, and sorry that Peter passed away also just a few weeks ago, is what a privilege it is to be a university professor. And I didn't really understand what he meant by that until I started to be in my, my 50s and, and later, because one of the marvelous things about a university environment is that the, in, the clientele is always 21 to 26. My graduate students are, are a, a kinetic constant. You know, it's kind of like the waterfall. It always looks the same, but it's never the same molecules of water. The graduate students are always young and excited about learning and have passion about creating their identity as PhD scientists. And despite the fact that I'm not the same age, even though they are, it keeps you young. Uh, and also being in a university environment when the undergraduates, they're always 18 to 21 years old. So you're constantly surrounded by people whose life is in front of them. They have unlimited potential and promise and optimism because they're, they're, they're just the, the world is an oyster. And that keeps us faculty who are aging constantly as, as young and vibrant as they are. And I, I would credit them and Peter for me to recognize why it's easy to maintain that excitement when you're always surrounded by people like that. Let me pick your brain on how Jax moves forward um, in this new era that we're in. Um, perhaps I should ask first, what has Jax done well? And you do know the follow-up question is going to be, what can Jax do better? What Jax has done well is maintained a standard of quality over many, many uh, editors. And, and I can see it continuing and accelerating under your leadership. But it's always been the place to go to send the very best work. And I, and I still believe that. Uh, and I still believe that the, the, the best work in chemistry, broadly speaking, is published in the JACS. Uh, the, the standard of quality uh, and capturing what's at the frontier has been the signature of JACS. And, and I think it's testimony to why it is still uh, so, so highly ranked, highly rated. You know, to the extent that you believe in metrics, it still stands the test of time. And, and I do believe uh, that, it, that it is the place that people want to publish if you want the world to know what you've done. What I think Jax could do better, and I'll go back to our original conversation about where the discipline is heading, is that the challenges we're finding now in the digitization of chemistry comes about from the lack of a, a consistent format and the ability to extract all of the data that is reported in the supporting information that undergirds the exciting results that appear in the narrative of the text. And the data mining activities that my colleagues in computer science are, are involved in, uh, as well as others, to be able to extract out that information in a machine readable form that's consistent uh, and that allows us to populate the databases and then comb them with algorithms that can learn trends in that data would be absolutely essential. And ACJACS could be at the vanguard of enabling the digitization of its data by taking that on. Let me ask you one last question here. Do you have any hobbies? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, and it's uh, not, not a big secret that I love speed. Uh, this was a disadvantage as a teenager, getting me into trouble with the local constables. Uh, but as, uh, as I grew up and became more and more responsible, uh, I became interested in road course racing in Porsches. Uh, and so I started building my, my own cars together with uh, my mechanic, Rick Karch. Um, we did that until around 2013. Uh, and then I decided uh, it was time to buy a factory built race car, a Porsche 987 GT3 Cup car uh, that uh, is just bulletproof and there was no maintenance. Uh, and I hired a company uh, called Autometrics in South Carolina who uh, store the car, they uh, transport it to the track, they do all the maintenance and coaching. Uh, and it's just a delight. Uh, I, I love doing this. Uh, it, it's uh, completely separate from chemistry, uh, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me. I, I, I love the thrill, I, I love the challenge. Uh, it, is a, it is very technology heavy, so that part of it is fun as well. Uh, but the, you know, that, that 
scratches an itch that otherwise uh, I can't do here in my office. I thought it was the second derivative that you preferred, not the uh, speed, <laughs> but acceleration. It is the acceleration. I'm addicted to the second derivative. Thank you very much. And that that also takes its uh, takes form in my skydiving, which I've done. And also, uh, I own four motorcycles, two out in San Diego, two here in Illinois. Uh, and uh, it's the rush uh, of that acceleration that uh, is is indescribable. I absolutely uh, love it and, and still do even to this day. It sounds like it's the same rush you get from science and specifically chemistry. Absolutely. So thank you, Scott. Um, with that, we come to a close unless you want to add any final words. Well, thank you very much for having me and for giving me the opportunity to contribute uh, to these uh, wonderful videos. I'm delighted to be part of the editorial advisory board to help you achieve your vision for how you will transform the journal and have it evolve into the next century. I look forward to helping you in any way I can. Thank you, Scott. Thanks a lot. It's been great having you on this, Jack's Conversations.